My name is Marcia Angel. I'm senior lecturer in social medicine at Harvard Medical School. I joined the editorial staff of the New England Journal of Medicine in 1979, rose through the ranks, became executive editor in 1988, and then editor-in-chief in 1999, uh, and served in that capacity for a year, stepped down in June of 2000. I was at the journal for 21 years. So it would be very hard for me to select particular uh, scientific contributions that changed everything overnight, although I'm sure there were some. Uh, one that I remember very well was the first paper we received uh, on AIDS in 1981. And uh, I was running the associate editor meeting, and Dr. Ron Malt, who was an associate editor at that time, presented this case of, oh, just a handful of patients in Los Angeles and New York who had come down with these strange opportunistic infections. Uh, the editor-in-chief was away, so I was sort of pinch hinting, uh, hitting for him in 1981. I remember we were all just incredulous uh, about this story. We didn't believe it, frankly. Uh, there had been a report in July, I think, of 81 in uh, MMWR. But still, that didn't necessarily mean it was so. Because the clinical syndrome itself was disparate. It, it didn't hang together, the constellation of findings. Uh, that, that their immune system would completely be wiped out in these specific ways, in this specific population. There was no way you could make sense of it uh, medically. And so we published these papers, three papers, uh, first reports of AIDS in, in 1981. And then what followed, what was this disease, what caused it, what could you do about it? Very rapidly, over maybe five years, the whole thing was, was kind of discovered uh, that this was indeed a retrovirus. I mean, there were all kinds of peculiar ideas that it came from Haiti, that it was a fungus, that was, and, and so they found the cause. And they found the first drug that had any effect, AZT. I think we published that in 86, maybe. An extraordinary unraveling of a, the description of a new disease uh, and what caused it and how to treat it. And of course, that continued over the next uh, many years that I was there, just unraveling this disease. There were many things going on during those 21 years that I was there, uh, not just in clinical medicine, but perhaps even more so in health policy, medical ethics, um, the, the relationship between commercial enterprises of various sorts uh, and medicine. And, and the New England Journal was a place where all of that was played out. In a sense, it, 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 it bound the medical profession together on these not strictly scientific issues. It was a place that doctors in all walks of life, all parts of the country, to, could go and see what was happening. And of course, for me, that was, I would say, the most exciting part of the job, that I had an eagle's eye view of everything that was happening in, in the broader sense uh, of, of medicine, uh, how medical care was delivered, uh, what the ethical issues were, uh, what the economic issues were, it was all, all right there. So it, it was a very exciting place to be. I think I saw my mission as scanning the environment for things that weren't right. In, in medicine. I've always been a skeptic. I, I think that's my general view of the world. Uh, I, I've always, whenever I'm told something, my first, my first feeling is, is that true or might it be something else? And I felt as the editor 
and editor of the New England Journal of Medicine, that an important role was to question conventional wisdom. That you really weren't making use of this powerful bully pulpit if you were simply saying everything is exactly as you thought it was yesterday. That what you really wanted to say was, but suppose it isn't so. And so that's what I was doing. I was looking at accepted wisdom and saying, should we continue to accept this? Um, one of the things that I wrote about was the breast implant controversy. It was generally assumed that breast implants, silicone gel filled breast implants, cause disease in the rest of the body. And I said, is that necessarily so? Now, this put me on the side of big business when I decided it wasn't so, or there was no evidence that it was so. Uh, and I didn't ask myself, whose side am I going to be on? Uh, I asked myself, is there evidence to support this? And so the first book I wrote for the public was on that, on the breast implant controversy. But the general attitude that you really have to follow the evidence wherever it leads. Do you like where it, whether, where it leads? Doesn't matter. You just follow it wherever it leads. I think an, an essential quality of, of a good scientist is skepticism. I think too often that is lost particularly when everybody believes that something's true. I, I think it's very hard to say I'm skeptical about that. But I think it's key in science. It's not taught in schools very well. I mean, in, in schools, in science education, even little kids, they think science is learning how to use a computer and, and looking through a microscope at some little things wiggling and maybe a bug collection. They don't learn to say, I don't believe that. I think the mission of the New England Journal of Medicine has been a university without walls for the entire medical profession. One place, or we would like to think of it as the place, I mean there are other places obviously, there are other good journals, but a place where you can go and see everything that's happening in medicine. As an editor, uh, my thought was that there should be something in every issue of the New England Journal of Medicine that every doctor, every subscriber, 200,000 people in different parts of medicine, some in you know, solo practice out in rural Nebraska, some in giant HMOs in New York, every doctor should find at least one thing in the journal that interests him or her. As the journal turns 200, all I can say is congratulations. Uh, I think it is still the best medical journal uh, in the world, uh, publishes the best research, uh, publishes the most interesting uh, papers on medical economics, uh, health policy. So my message would be keep on keeping on, I guess. Uh, it's, it's terrific. Uh, during my 21 years at the New England Journal of Medicine, there were a couple of things that I was most interested in. One was health policy, and the essential question is, is health care a commodity to be delivered according to the ability to pay, or to find an insurer who will pay, or is it a social good that everyone should have, that should be distributed not according to the ability to pay, but according to medical need? And I came down in that second school very, very firmly and more firmly as I went along. Uh, and I favor a single payer system, a nonprofit single payer system, essentially Medicare for all and a nonprofit delivery system. That is still an issue. We still haven't solved that. Uh, and, uh, you know, we, we have a dreadfully inefficient, expensive system that leaves too many people out. So that was one issue. Uh, a second issue was care at the end of life. Uh, that, that, that the technology to extend life had become an end in itself. And 
people were not being allowed sufficient choice as to when and how they would die. Uh, sometimes earlier and more peacefully rather than later and, and uh, in agony. So that was maybe a second thing. And finally, the introduction of serious bias into medicine by the pharmaceutical industry, the investor-owned pharmaceutical industry, uh, whose interest is not in medical research, uh, but in uh, the, the value of their shareholder stock. I think the most important role that the New England Journal of Medicine can play in the future is as a truth teller in a context in which for-profit healthcare businesses are everywhere. And I mean the investor-owned private insurance industry, I mean the for-profit imaging centers, delivery system, and I mean, perhaps most of all, the investor-owned pharmaceutical and device industries. They are so powerful now. They have um, distorted uh, medical research and medical care so much that the New England Journal of Medicine, perhaps uniquely, is in a position where it can watch this and blow the whistle on this uh, as it needs to be blown. I don't think there's any other institution that can do that.